Welcome to the second primary care clerkship on BCG interpretation. Today's podcast will be on rhythm interpretation. My name is Dr. Melissa Stiles from the Department of Family Medicine, and I'm joined by Dr. Dean Keller from the Department of Internal Medicine. Here in front of us are the guidelines for rhythm and intervals. These seem a little more generalized in their approach than other aspects of BCG interpretation we talked about last time, Dean. Is there a reason for this? Yes, uh, rhythm is more of an interpretive process. It's not simply adding wave amplitudes together or calculating a rate. Rhythm interpretation can involve studying a strip and trying to reason through what is happening with the various waveforms. It's a fun and challenging aspect of the ECG and with a few basic principles as outlined on the slide, even the most challenging rhythm can be broken down. Well, let's start with the first bullet point and then review some examples. Can you talk about ordering an ECG? Great. Uh, I have an example of a West Clinic ECG requisition slip, and I just wanted to emphasize that not only do I usually order a 12 lead, but if there's a rhythm that might be challenging, then I also order a rhythm strip to get more material. And an example would be uh, the normal 12 lead, and on the bottom the rhythm strip, but by checking off the rhythm uh, strip on the requisition, you'll also get further uh, leads, and you can see this is an example of three leads, and you can order as many pages as you want to go over it with the uh, calipers. Going back to the guidelines, can you expand on the second and third points, focusing on waveforms and intervals? Yeah, the next example I think is a very good summary. It's very basic, but oftentimes uh, is very important. The first thing we should look at is the waveforms themselves, and that's the P wave representing the depolarization of the atrium, the QRS representing the depolarization of the ventricle, and the T wave representing the repolarization of the ventricle. So you certainly want to make sure that those proper waveforms in their proper sequence are present. Also looking at intervals, the PR interval uh, starts at the beginning of the P wave and goes to the beginning of the QRS. That should always be less than one large box or 0.2 seconds. Second interval is a QRS interval and that should be less than three small boxes or 0.12 seconds. And finally, the QT interval. If you look at the top of the strip, there's something called the QTC, and uh, that's the QT corrected interval, which you do for the rate. I like to have the computer actually do that for me. And that should be less than uh, two uh, large boxes. Finally, the last point is pattern recognition. This is something that comes with experience, and I suspect as the students review more tracings, they will begin to start recognizing certain rhythms. Uh, Very true, Melissa. An example is atrial fibrillation. Uh, This is the most common sustained outpatient arrhythmia seen uh, in our primary care clinics, and after seeing it several times, uh, I think the students will begin to recognize that pattern almost uh, immediately. Perhaps some examples would be useful illustrating how these basic principles can be applied. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, I tried to put together a variety of strips and we'll take a look at them and also for more practice these students can visit the ECG website. There are many examples with some self-study quizzes there. So the best way to learn rhythms, I think, is simply to go through several of them. And this is an example here of an interesting rhythm. And I might comment that if the student would like to hit the pause button and try to interpret the strip first and then turn it back on, that might be fun for them to do. Anyway, looking at the first strip, Going back to the very basic things, I oftentimes will start out on the left-hand side, and I see a P wave, a QRS, a P wave, and if you take a look, uh, you'll see that there is two P waves with a dropped beat in the middle. In other words, a P wave QRS 
inverted T wave, a P wave, and then another P wave. So this would be an example of a heart block, and it's called a Mobitz II, and the definition of a Mobitz II is that the PR intervals are always the same prior to a dropped beat. And uh, Melissa, this might be a good time actually to review heart blocks. Yes, there are three major heart blocks, first degree, second degree, of which there are two, uh, which Dane just pointed out, and third degree. So the first degree, um, the next example, really focuses on intervals in the PR interval. So the PR interval is long, greater than one big box, 0.2, but there are no dropped beats. And Dean, can you expand? You went over one of the second degree blocks, and then there's the Winky Bach. Can you describe what happens with Winky Bach? Yeah, the next tracing, the student again might want to try to take a look at this first by themselves, but looking at it, you'll see that there's a P wave, a QRS. The T waves are somewhat difficult to see on this strip, so don't worry about that. But then comes another P wave, a QRS. And then I think you can see a P wave going to another P wave. So there appears to be a pause and a block there. And again, looking at the diagram, we've labeled the two P waves and the drop beat, so you can see that clearly. The important thing to see here is the preceding PR intervals get longer before the drop beat. And this is called a Winky Bach, uh, and this is a second degree type 1. And this is usually less serious than the Mobitz 2, which I showed earlier. And then the more most serious block is the third degree. And what happens here is the atrial rate is completely independent of the ventricular rate. As we look at the example and march out both the P waves and the QRS waves, there is no pattern between them. The P does not come in front of the QRS in any particular pattern or interval. They are completely independent. And that is the hallmark of the third degree block. Yeah, that's a very good tracing, Melissa, and this oftentimes um, requires a pacemaker. And I always like to remind myself that uh, heart blocks are often like burns, and that's an easy way to remember it. A first degree burn is not as serious as a third degree burn, and with heart blocks, uh, it's the same analogy. The next group of tracings that we're going to look at represent some different rhythms, and we'll give the student an idea of the wide array of arrhythmias that can be seen. Looking at the next rhythm strip, you will see upon close examination that there are P waves, there are QRSs, and there are T waves. But if you look at the P waves, and we've outlined three of them for you, they don't all look the same. And you might notice that they also have different PR intervals. And that is the definition, basically, of a wandering atrial pacemaker three different P wave morphologies with three different PR intervals. Uh, and when this is faster, it's called multifocal atrial tachycardia and is a very common rhythm seen in COPD patients. So when you are admitting a COPD patient and it's an irregular rhythm, don't assume it's atrial fibrillation. Many times it may be multifocal atrial tachycardia and that's treated much differently. The next rhythm strip looks fairly normal for the first several beats, and then you'll see an early beat. However, the early beat still has a narrow QRS complex, but if you'll notice, there is no P wave before it. So the first beat, second beat, third beat, fourth beat look fine, and then the next one is early. This would be a premature junctional complex, junctional because it's still narrow. Also, we don't see any P waves, so we know this is not coming from the atrium. And there's another example of a PJC uh, further down the strip. The next is a very common uh, example. It's a very common rhythm you'll see. 
supraventricular tachycardia. And as you notice, it's a regular rapid rate and there are no P waves. In the other example, this is an example where if you look at for the pattern, again, there are no P waves. It's a very slow rhythm and this is called a slow junctional rhythm. For the next two rhythms, I think we'll look at some pattern recognition. And here we'll look at the entire 12 lead. And uh, we have a couple of examples. And here, really what I would like you to focus on is the QRS interval. You'll notice that it is wider than three small boxes. And you'll also notice that it has a pattern, the so-called rabbit ears. Uh, especially if you look in the uh, appropriate leads. Um, and first, we'll start out by uh, looking at a right bundle branch block. And again, focusing only on the QRS interval and looking at leads V1 and V2, you see the characteristic RR prime, also known as rabbit ears. One other thing that's important to realize is that with a bundle branch block, the T wave should be inverted. Normally an inverted T wave is abnormal, but this is part and parcel of a bundle branch uh, block. And this is a nice example of a right bundle branch block. The next example, again focusing on the QRS duration and the so-called rabbit ear pattern, especially in V5 and V6, although the pattern isn't quite as clear here, as in right bundle branch block, uh, this is a left bundle branch block. And the most important thing to remember about left bundle branch blocks is that you cannot diagnose any uh, acute ischemic uh, events because of the left bundle branch block pattern obscuring the parts of the ECG which are required. So in a patient like this, you have to rely on your story of chest pain and your cardiac troponins. The next three examples uh, will focus on atrial fibrillation. And when you look at the hallmark of atrial fibrillation, looking at a few things, one lack of P waves, and then also an irregular, irregular rate and rhythm. So as you go through these examples, there are no P waves. And then as you march out the rhythm with a caliper, the rhythm is irregularly irregular. And finally, another pattern recognition tracing, if you will. We have three examples, and this is one that you don't want to see. But you will notice that they are very wide. QRSs. They are quite rapid and really that's all you see. You don't see much in the way of P waves or T waves. This is known as ventricular tachycardia and this is one that you'll want to recognize very quickly especially when you take your advanced cardiac life support. And we have three examples of it for you and you'll notice that they don't look exactly the same, but I think we can all appreciate that they're wide, they're very fast, and again, this is an example of a rhythm that you will recognize very quickly if you see this just a few times. Well, we've reviewed a number of examples. Dean, what other resources are there for the students that want to continue practicing ECG interpretation? Uh, Melissa, I would refer them back to the website. There are several areas on the website I think they would enjoy. They're clearly marked as quizzes, for instance, and they can just click on the quiz area, and there's multiple choice rhythm interpretations. Uh, and there's also a good review of the other areas we've previously studied in the first podcast. So this is the final podcast for the ECG course, and I would like to thank all of you for listening in, and we hope this will be helpful not only in your clinical clerkship uh, in the outpatient settings, 
but also the inpatient settings uh, as well, and that the website will be a resource for you both your third and fourth year.